Hi guys, I'm here with Curtis Malik, current world ranked number 45, I believe. Um, last time he was on here, he was ranked like 49 or something like that. So he's going up as we predicted. And yeah, number one, not number one yet. No, no. up, I meant up. Oh, oh, up, 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 yeah. Um, but um, today we're going to actually interview him and go through his past as a junior and his aspirations when he was young, uh, as well as what he's up to today and how he's getting on on the tour and his goals for the future and where he wants to end up in the long run. Um, so we're going to find out all that great information today. And yeah, it's going to be good. So let's get right into it. Well, thanks for having me on the podcast again. Looking forward to the conversation today. Yeah, that was very kind words, Curtis. <laughs> thanks for that. <laughs> okay, so we're going to start off at the beginning. So what I want to know is how you got into squash. Like, where did you start playing? Uh, why did you start playing? And all that sort of... Yeah, so I started off when I was around five or six at my local club in Copthorne. So my dad took me and my brother Perry on court from a very young age. Just started out as a bit of fun, kind of throwing balls, running out of cones, just trying to just enjoy getting on court. And then as you kind of got older, between six, seven, eight, we'd always go and watch my dad play matches at, at the club and different clubs around Sussex. And we just got a bit more involved in the sport. Mm -hmm. I was always playing different sports when I was younger, but like football, cricket, rugby, tennis, uh, but squash, my, my dad could coach me in it. So... From a young age, me and Perry were always on court mm -hmm. together playing and Dad was always coaching us. And was your dad like an experienced coach or, or how long had he played squash for before that? No, he wasn't an experienced coach, but he 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 only started playing when he was like 19 or 20, so it was actually quite late. He kind of got like very addicted to the sport, he loved it. But he, got, he kind of got the squash bug, a lot of players get that when they first find out what squash is and... And then, but like I said, from the young age, he started coaching us, and until now, really, he's still our coach. Mm, yeah, and yeah, when it comes to today, and you're getting coached by him, how much is? I guess what I'm trying to say is how how much is the split between what you come up with, like with tactical ideas and stuff like that, and what he comes up with? Is it pretty even the split, or did you discuss it and kind of come to a conclusion together? Or yeah, we we definitely discuss a lot of uh, my game, also my siblings' game as well with with him. A lot of it comes from both of us, really. Uh, I think that's the best way to keep the relationship strong and build trust. I think mm -hmm. that's that way you can analyse together and look at it in a similar sort of way. Mm. But then you can also look at it in in your own sort of way and then you discuss what you think and then what he thinks and then, mm. then you come to the conclusions together on what you need to be working on and how to build your game and improve. Yeah, I mean, for those of you that don't know Cameron, Kurt is that... Um, He's very good at observing little um, differences in technique uh, and kind of the fine details. Uh, he's very good at that. Yeah. Um, so he's very good at constructing someone's technique from the ground up. Um, and, well, he's proven he's got a good track record with all the Maliks yeah. uh, and others down, down at K2 where they're yeah, playing yeah, it yeah. now. Because all the things that our dad teaches us and other things that we translate back down to the juniors that we coach at our club, and we've got a couple of... We've got two or three other national champions within our club now. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I definitely think he, he must be up there with with the top. Um, like for for me, there are there are different types of coaches. You've yeah. got the coaches that are great at um, developing players from scratch. You've got coaches that are great at getting players from like maybe a junior to a professional level. Yeah. Then you've got some that can do both. Uh, so I guess I look at like football managers where you've got some that are great at. Uh, maximizing the potential of a, a low budget team yeah, yeah, and then yeah. you've got some that are great at using a lot of money wisely you know you've got your Pep Guardiola's uh, Man City and people like that um, managing the top of the top yeah and, the best but, and then some are great in relegation battles or promotions uh, for, from the championship yeah. um, so you've got all these different kind of coaches and, and it, it doesn't mean one is right and one is wrong yeah. but I definitely have a lot of respect for the coaches that can uh, produce players from nothing because uh, in my mind, that's harder to do. Um, yeah, it's a much long, longer term thing. It's a long term. You've got to have a lot of patience. I mean, my, my coach, my first coach, um, uh, or my first kind of, um, uh, I'd call it serious coach where I wanted to improve, uh, was a guy called Graham Stevenson. And yeah. he was just, one. Of, he's got to be one of the best at that. Uh, uh, partly because of his attitude. He, he was so enthusiastic, po enthusiastic positive. Essentially the perfect coach for 
a junior wanting to improve a young junior who's not that good. I was, I was shocking at first. Yeah. I mean, you can agree with that. <laughs> used to, we, he used to come to the county squads when we were uh, when we were very young, and Graham bought this new kid on court and said he was quite keen. And then I would probably because I was one of the best in the group at the time. Yeah. I'd be doing the demonstrations with the coach yeah. or some other kid. And then Josh would come up and go, right, this is how not to do the demonstration. Yeah, yeah. You'd always do like the thing not to do. It was so funny when you first yeah. started. But then I, I transitioned to actually doing most of the demonstrations and I got to a point where I was quite good at them. Yeah. Decent, <laughs> no. decent junior. I, yeah. like, I, I, you know, I, like obviously you were, you were always the best in Sussex at the time. I mean, you got... Um, uh, what's his name? You've got Peter Barkley as well, who, yeah. who was um, definitely a, a good player, a yeah. bit older. But um, I remember m- the first time I ever saw you was at a Sussex squad, but you were kind of separated from the others because you were <laughs> you were like it was. Like, I think I was in the B squad at the time, yeah. and you were you were you came early for the A squad. Yeah. I used to do the B squad and then do the A squad afterwards, yeah. like do both, just get as many hours on court as possible, which is why I improved so much because yeah. I just spent so much time on court. But I remember watching you on the other court across. Yeah. Uh, you're hit like I was probably about nine. Yeah. And obviously you would have been nine, yeah. and I was seeing you hit just straight drives to the back of the court to yourself. Yeah. Just repeatedly. Now, obviously, that seems quite simple now. Now, but when you're but that age... when you're that age, to see someone eight or nine, like you might have even been eight, to be able to consistently hit the ball to the back of the court tight yeah. to yourself, like I could not believe it. I was like, who is this guy? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, like, so I think it, it was crazy to me that a f- couple of years later we were competing against each other yeah, in tournaments, yeah, in tournaments and yeah. you know. You were the only reason I didn't get to number one in England because yeah. <laughs> I was number two, you were yeah. number one. Um, and yeah, that, that's crazy to me looking at how good you were from a young age. Yeah. Um, so, so when it comes to those sort of solo routines and that sort of thing, was that something you put a lot of focus on when you were young? Yeah, that, that was probably one thing I do remember quite vividly when I was younger was, was spending a lot of time on court by myself. Like dad would be coaching one of us in the other court and then he'd be telling the other one of us to do like a solo practice your volleys, practice your drives, whatever, all these different types of solo exercises whilst he was coaching them, we'd switch over. I remember that quite vividly, which is quite a good memory to have. Mm-hmm. So I, I must have clocked up quite a lot of hours just hitting the ball by myself, mm-hmm. figuring things out, and then by the time, you, before you know it, you're, you're quite a good player, I guess. Yeah, and when did you realise that you were quite a good player? Because obviously at first you just play and you're just playing and you, you're doing it for fun. Yeah. And then at some point you must have realised, oh, you know what, I, I'm actually quite good for my age. I, I'm better than average. Uh, was there any point that you, you felt that? Yeah, I guess it was probably the first real taste of like squash competition was probably when I was seven. We played in, I played in the Sussex under 11 team when I was seven. We played like Hampshire, Surrey, Kent, Middlesex and maybe one other. And I remember playing it like maybe three or something and it was like the last match of the day and it was like the deciding match I had to play this guy called Lawrence Green who was probably a couple of years older than me at the time one of the top juniors in the age group mm-hmm. above when we played it like later on and then I ended up winning 10-8 in the fifth because it was English scoring English to nine back then and I just couldn't believe that I'd beaten a guy almost two years older than me and kind of from that day I kind of realised like, oh I'm actually quite enjoying the sport I thought it was quite good and that gives you kind of confidence at a young age that you enjoy the com- competition yeah uh, and back then did, did you go in with much of a game plan or did you just go off instinct to, you know at the time? Uh, there was no game plan when I was that age <laughs> it was just pure instincts like I didn't even know what a game plan was until I was probably like 15 or 16 yeah yeah it, it was when you were, you were that age you just going on there to have fun and like just yeah. hit the shots that you think you can hit which were a lot of shots for you <laughs> yeah. yeah when I was younger I used to go for a lot of shots and I was quite expressive in the way I played, and that's, that's the way I enjoyed it. Yeah, I mean, I remember your game basically countered me almost perfectly because you would fire the ball in so much, and my movement was definitely my weakness uh, yeah. at the time of my fitness. Um, so against anyone else, I know I could um, I, I could outplay them at the front of the court, but Curtis was the one yeah. player I couldn't outplay <laughs> at the front of the court. Uh, <laughs> in, England, in England, yeah. In England, yeah. yeah. Um, Although I, the Egyptians were pretty good. Like, yeah, I, I'll be at, like at that age. I don't think I played an Egyptian. Yeah. Um, oh yeah, when we were very young at that age. Yeah. yeah. I, I played the Malaysians and I did well against them. Yeah. Uh, but I never played the Egyptians. Um, so my game worked quite well against the Malaysians, who were also good at that age. Yeah. Um, obviously, people like Yao. I never played Yao himself, but mm. I played some of the others, and got some good wins there. But yeah. um, Yao was definitely 
Like, for me, Yao... Class about money. Yao was the reason I actually got... Uh, he's one of the reasons I improved so much. Literally, him single-handedly. Really? Yeah. Because I remember I played at Pontefract at the Silver. Oh, yeah, yeah, They yeah. used to come over. The, the Malaysians all used to come over um, to a tournament at Pontefract. Um, it was a couple of weeks before the British Junior Open. So it was in December after yeah. Christmas. Yeah. And Pont- I remember... Ponty Silver was always a big yeah. event. I remember Yao was there. It, it would have been 2011. No, it would have been 2010 because it would have been the 2011 edition, British. Yeah. Um, so it would have been 2010. So how would, I'd have been 11. And yeah, so it would have been my first year of the under 13 age group. And I hadn't been playing tournaments for that long. And I remember seeing Yao. Yeah. And just, he had full control. He, he was only, he was tiny. like Small, very small, small for his age. Very, yeah. like, he didn't look imposing in any way. But he could put the ball wherever he wanted from anywhere yeah. with such great control. And I remember watching that and thinking, how on earth is someone who's of his age, he was 12, that good, that skillful? Yeah. Who have that much ball control. And I was like, well, you know what? I'm going to spend the whole year trying to improve, ball. improve my ball control and get on his level. Now, I'm not saying I ever got to his level, but the next year I went to the British Open in my second year of the age, 2013, and we both got top 16, didn't yeah, we? Yeah, yeah. Um, so we were like the two two highest uh, European players. Victor Cron was in the mix as well. Yeah. Um, and that was all from watching someone like Yao play. Um, so, yeah, that that's definitely um, big respect to Yao. Yeah. A bit of a tangent there, but I thought yeah, I'd, no, I'd pay it's respect to Obviously, a class player now and well established top 20 players. So. Yeah, because there was always a question mark with him of, of will he grow enough? Will, will he be big enough to um, challenge in the professional game? And obviously, he's still not particularly big, but he's found his own way to, to yeah, play quality squash. Uh, it's all from, from having the skills and the speed and uh, all the things he had when he yeah. was young, but he's just worked on that and he. He went on to win the British Open that year and, and yeah. win basically every time for his age group. So when I saw him at Pontefract, I didn't actually know that he would win the whole British Junior Open. Yeah. Um, so I, I was definitely, um, I, I definitely had um, high a high opinion of him before he won just by watching him. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so let's move on a little bit. Yeah, because you got a bit older. You got to about fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, yeah. and then you had an injury. Yeah. Um, you broke your ankle or foot yeah. or something happened. So, yeah, I'd, I'd done really well between the ages of like 10 to probably 15, 16. I was British champion, national champion a few times and European team champion. So I won a lot of those titles, uh, played for England in every age group really. And then like when I was 16, I broke my ankle on court playing in a, a silver event in Ipswich. Mm-hmm. And that... That was a really painful experience and also one that left me out on court for about eight months. I was out for about eight months. I came back pretty well to win the Dutch Junior Open when I was 17. But then shortly after that, I started getting another injury. I got patella tendonitis in the knee. Mm. And like, <clears throat> I guess quite a lot of kids get that or when they're growing. Because I was, I was more average height when I was young. And then between like 17, 18, 19, I started growing loads. So I think the fact that I had an injury in my ankle affected the structure of my joints a little bit so my knees were taking a bit more of the impact and then mm. so that knees started going on for about nine months so I had those injuries there so in the space of like two or three years I was injured for probably two of those years and I was still struggling with like adductor injuries as well back then mm. and then yeah when I was like 17 18 I decided to start playing some some like low level PSA like satellite events mm-hmm. some local ones around Europe but it was it was kind of a rough time as well because my youngest brother was also really ill. He had a brain tumor, so mm. my, my my I was training a lot, but my mind wasn't really focused enough on the squash to be making that big improvement that you needed for any transition from juniors to seniors. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then, so that was a tough period of two years as well. So in the space of those four or five years, it was pretty tough. And then and then so I had then I had at nineteen I had one really good year in PSA. I got from like three hundred and fifty or something to like top 150 in the space of a year mm-hmm. and then and then COVID yeah so I had one proper year on PSA year one and a half and then mm-hmm. two years of COVID yeah and then since COVID I've kind of managed to find my way a little bit put a lot of a lot of work in on court mm-hmm. and 
and where I am now, really. That's well, kind of where we yeah. are. Yeah, I mean, we'll come back to COVID in a minute. I just want to go back to the injuries. Yeah. Because I remember thinking at the time, because I feel like we both had very different approaches in um, when it came to playing matches and training. Yeah. Uh, mine was definitely too far the other way, where it was like, if I wasn't feeling great... What training was? Uh, yeah, if, if, if I was... Uh, like I didn't want to ruin my match results by doing too much hard training just like close to a match yeah. and that basically meant I didn't train hard at all because yeah. you had matches quite all often yeah so it meant I never at that period of time I didn't get fit enough just because I I was too worried about pe- what people thought of my results yeah. I was like okay I want to make sure I'm playing my best every time I play but that meant I played worse because I got nervous and I wasn't fit so what am I meant to do yeah. but I always felt like you kind of did the opposite where you played matches the day before tournaments and stuff yeah. like that and I always felt like that was putting a strain on your body and I don't know if you feel the same way or if, if you felt it was just the injuries were just kind of uh, freak accidents or, or no to be honest I generally think those matches for me back then were vital and actually for my development now yeah I still like I, I could play through like quite a lot of like fatigue and stuff yeah I don't think I generally got injured because of what I was doing training and match wise yeah. I just think the ankle was just a freak accident yeah my patella tendons were just the fact that I wasn't doing maybe the right strength training yeah. and the fact that I was growing at the same time but it's probably linked to because of your ankle yeah you, 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 the, your strength had gone down because of that yeah. and then that's when you get then other you start injuries. going back into competition again straight yeah. away and you've been stationary for like seven mm. or eight months, yeah. and you've lost all that tendon strength, and you have all the muscle muscular strength in your quads and stuff. Mm-hmm. And I think that just had caused caused a cascade of events to happen with yeah. my injuries. Mm. And maybe I was maybe I, I maybe played through too many of the little niggles in the adductors that, yeah. that caused him to like hurt a lot. Yes. Uh, and I spent a lot of time post that period strengthening up my my, yeah. my lower body and everything else to a point where like. I would class myself as injury free and I look up my body's the, like my main thing now. I, g- I guess because you've gone through those tough times of injuries when you were younger, it allows you to um, not make those mistakes Same again, mistakes. like you know, focus more on your body yeah. to not allow that to happen again. Whereas you get some kids who they, they go through injury free and they think, well, what's the point in doing a really good yeah, warm that's up? Very true. What's the point in doing a good warm down? I'm fine. I've never been injured before. Yeah. And then they get a really bad one later on. Yeah. All they keep getting the same niggles that come back. Yeah. I mean, I guess the unfortunate one was someone like Rami, um, yeah. who had a bigger injury when he was younger. Yeah. But then that basically just took him out. Well, for his whole career. But Metney's always inhibited yeah. in some sort of way for that Which 10, 10 to 15 years in a row. Probably the biggest shame in the history of squash. Yeah. Um, because if that hadn't have happened, then, well, he'd have got it. Well, he already did win everything, but he'd have won everything a lot more. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and we'd have been able to watch him play for longer, which would have been uh, great for everyone. Yeah. Um, but just by but out of interest, do you, do you remember who you were playing when your ankle did go? Yeah, <laughs> it was Isaac Warcliffe. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. He's a guy a couple of years older than me and juniors. Uh-huh. Uh huh. He I... actually went around telling everyone that he taxied me, <laughs> <laughs> but that was not what happened at all. I was, I went to the back left corner. As I pushed back out of the back left corner, my ankle went right and my body went left for some reason. Yeah. It was a really weird movement. And as soon as my ankle went over, I was like, I fell straight to the floor and I was like screaming in pain. Yeah. But yeah, I nice. had a little claim to fame there, but it was, well, just, <laughs> it was, it was just a basic drive. Because I remember there was a time I don't, I doubt Michael Matamor will be watching this, but I remember a time I, I managed to roll Michael Matamor's ankle with a taxi. <laughs> <laughs> he won't remember, yeah. but to be fair, I didn't actually remember I played him at the. It was at the National Squash Centre one time. I don't. Yeah. I I've only just remembered that I played that match, but yeah. Uh, <laughs> that did happen, um, but you like you like breaking a few. Well, back then, didn't you? <laughs> it's, like, it's not good, is it? <laughs> no. yeah, uh, don't joke about it. No, sorry, sorry, Michael. Michael. Yeah, sorry, Curtis. Uh, <laughs> um, sorry, Michael. Uh, maybe it didn't happen. Maybe uh, it was a dream. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> probably was nervous. <laughs> probably was nervous. It was just a dream. Um, and uh, did you play him after that? And and did you? Did play? Did you play Isaac after that match later on in the juniors? I think I played him once more. Was there any tension there where you thought, "Oh, um, I hope it doesn't happen again because I'm playing the same guy"? Or, or no? Had you forgotten about it? Completely? No, not playing Isaac. It wasn't. 
although he, he was like a big kid, he was yeah. quite tall, he was strong, very heavily built. Uh, so you'd have to, have to be careful moving yeah. around him, like. But not so, not saying that it's his fault or anything like that. But oh, what no. I mean, it what I mean is, um, did just it bring back memories? Like, for example, if you played on the same court again, or you played the same person again, where that big injury happened, it was more was so there a bit... the same court. Yeah, I went back to Ipswich for a silver uh-huh. under 19s and I had to play on the court. On that court, I did it in, in like the course or something. And it, it did make me nervous before the match. I mean, yeah. Playing Isaac in a different tournament didn't make me nervous. Okay, it, it was, was the court. court. But I managed to get through that tournament. I actually ended up winning the silver, which oh, is nice. quite a nice way to come back to that club. Yeah, that's good. And after that, then I was okay. But yeah. I, I would say the initial matches back when I when my physio said I could play and start trying to play again, I was very apprehensive about moving mm-hmm. quickly and properly on it. I just felt like something was going to happen. Yeah, you, it was it was more the confidence thing when you're coming back with an injury like that. Yeah, because you know the the strength is probably there. Yeah, but because you haven't done those quick movements in such a long time. Yes, you don't feel confident making those movements. So initially, that was the hardest bit, I would say. Now, just like touching on courts specifically, were there any places or courts you really enjoyed playing on, and were there any that you really dreaded playing on, like well, in the juniors? Yeah, because for me, I, there, for me, yeah. I loved playing at uh, we. It used to be called Corals down in... <laughs> <laughs> what? Because... <laughs> no, it used to be called, called Corals down in Brighton and Hove. Like, yeah. That was our main rival club for... for we were ba- I was based at Copthorne, now Crawley. Uh, yeah. That was our main rival club, and I used to love going down there and trying to, trying to win. Now, th- just the reason I laugh at that <laughs> is because if someone were to ask me my least favourite place to play, the place where I never played well, <laughs> I would have said the exact same place. But it's true. Curtis used to, like, he used to play so well on yeah, those courts. got a good track record. There. His track record there was ridiculous. My track record there is the worst of any place ever. Yeah. I don't think I've ever played a good match there and I've played there a solid, like, 15 times. Because yeah, we've always played, like, league games there. Yeah, so oh. ca- into counties County closed. I just couldn't play. Like yeah. every, but you were so good on those courts. Yeah. Which is funny because those courts get hot. Bouncy, yeah. Which when you were young, I, like you were a shot player. So it, to me, it, I always found it confusing that you were good on those courts. Yeah. But but it was more mental, I think. Yeah, but I remember you beating Tom Walsh eleven love on, on one of those matches. Yeah, it might have been in silver, I think. Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, that, that's that, they're Tom's home courts, um, and Tom always used to play well on those courts. Uh, yeah, I guess it's his home crowd as well, so yeah. maybe he's a bit nervous. But that's why I couldn't believe that he had a bit more like, freedom. But yeah. Yeah. I, just, I, I always enjoyed playing there. Yeah. I actually quite like the club. Yeah. For me, I, I actually quite like the club. I, I actually like the warm bouncy courts. I thought they were very true courts. <laughs> you, I get you didn't like it, but right. I, I like the courts there. And they did good cheesy chips. Yeah, that's the... <laughs> that's, that's, the that's why... I, yeah, that, that's the, the bit I like about it. I, yeah. I don't like much else, but the cheesy but, chips. Um, although that's closed down, hasn't it? Yeah. Yeah, there, there's some sort of thing going on there now, which is a shame, but... It's a shame. We'll see what's happening. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Big, big shame. Um... Not, other than that though other courts around the country I, when I was younger I didn't really care what court I played on I was more worried about kind of like oh who am I playing what do I need to think about doing in yes. this match and that kind of thing yeah yeah no, no I mean I think for me it was something that held me back was letting different environments affect me too much yeah. get too stressed about it oh this court's like this uh, my game isn't working I think that was just because I wasn't adaptable enough as a player Yeah. I think that came down to the fact that I wasn't fit enough um, yeah. because the fitter you are the more adaptable you can be because you can implement different styles yeah. and tactics yeah. um, whereas if you have one game plan and that's all you can do um, then the court will affect you, can, you. yeah exactly yeah um, and you're generally quite consistent with your performances even if the court conditions are different yeah yeah you can just uh, kind of morph into the situation yeah. that you need yeah. and it comes like that that also applies to playing different players as yeah. well um it is it's the debate of when you're playing someone no matter who they are do you just play your own game plan or do you adapt your game plan to who they are yeah i, I think different players do different approaches uh, what, what, where would you put yourself in that category? I feel like you're you adapt your game plan depending on who you pl- you're playing against. Yeah, like n- for now, like in the last three or four years, is I'm adapting my game plans all the time for the player I'm playing. Yeah, and more so recently, also to the court conditions. That's something like mm. Shabagi yeah. talks about. Like, I mean, Nick, Nick Matthew would have done that a lot. Yeah, too. Nick Matthew would have done that. Like Mo talks about that a lot. Like, if you if you're not adapting to the court conditions, 
and your player, then you're missing out on the key part of the match, really, and then mm-hmm. uh, maybe a key part to maybe that's the difference between winning and losing. Yes, I I think the the, the biggest thing that I I dislike though is when people say, oh, but the conditions are same for everyone, which is true, but conditions are always going to favour one type of player to, to another. To another yeah. It's like it's like in tennis, you've got the clay court, hard court, yeah, grass that's court. True. It's People like, call them specialists in certain Yeah, areas. It's, it's like you, someone might lose to Nadal in the French Open uh, like, on, on the clay, and then someone might say, oh, but the conditions are the same for everyone. It's like, well, yeah, but Nadal's really good on that type of court. Because <laughs> you grew up on the courts like that. Yeah. Like the Egyptians are very good on the most hot, quick bouncing exactly. courts. Exactly. They, they know how to kill the ball in a hot bouncing yeah. court. I feel like people, more traditional players yeah. don't. People overlook a lot of context with with um, performances. Yeah. They they see the result and they think, oh, someone, you know, they don't think, oh, that would suit that player. Yeah. Well, it, like the fact of the matter is, sport is dynamic, and yes, you want to adapt. And if you want to be the best player in the world, world number one or whatever, you've got to be able to be consistent on different in different conditions. Yeah. But on single results, I feel like people read too much into it sometimes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like there's no, you know, there's no embarrassment losing to Nadal at the French Open, right? right? Um, but some people would be like, oh, well, you've got to play to the conditions. And yeah. it's like, well, yeah, you try, but it's, it's not that easy. And that's why the top players are so impressive that they can do it. Because yeah, it's the most adaptable. It's hard Especially to do. Especially in a sport like squash. Yeah. Uh, and and the uh, court conditions change more so than tennis, I would yeah. say. And a lot of club players, if any club players are watching, like they, they might not understand I mean some of you might be team players who play at different clubs and, and fair enough you'll understand but those who just go to a club night and play at your club and are just used to those courts at the club like courts get very different like time of year yeah. place they, they feel different it's not like tennis where the surface is different yeah. it's not like that extreme but it makes a big difference um, yeah and- one thing I would give some advice to like upcoming juniors or any players is Try and get on as many different courses as you can. So, like, mm. put yourself into different leagues, adult leagues, whatever, yeah. where you're playing different clubs and you get to try different courts out so that you do become more adaptable in your games. And when you do come to a different court, you're more used to it. It's not so, like, strange or alien to you. Yeah, because I feel like with with you, you've improved a lot more recently because you've been travelling around a lot more. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, and that's meant that before you played a lot at K2, yeah. whereas now you're playing everywhere all yeah. the time and your game's improving um, as a result yeah. of that. Um, uh, and just let, let's move into the travel side of things, because now, obviously, you're on the tour full-time. Yeah. Um, you're doing well. Um, but one thing I do know is that you're traveling a lot. Yeah. And just to put it in perspective, so you're in Singapore, yeah. and then you went got home, yeah. and then you went to Hong Kong almost straight after. Yeah. And then he got back, and he was back for one night. So he got back. What time did you fly? I'll, I'll give you a little rundown. I'm Go sorry. on, give us give us a rundown. So I went to Singapore for the because I was the first reserve. I got in quite late, so I got in the week before. I played the tournament in France, had two days at home. Went to Singapore, played the Singapore Open, got to the second round, uh, and lost to Suzuki. And then I had to fly back on the Saturday, landed on the Sunday, and then. I got an email on the Monday saying that a space had come up in the Hong Kong draw. So then I'd got into the Hong Kong draw, which started on the the next or, or on the Sunday. So I'd have to I had to leave on the Wednesday. So I went to Singapore back and then to Hong Kong to play Ica and unfortunately lost in the first round there. And then I from Hong Kong I flew straight from Hong Kong to London, and then London, which was a fifteen hour flight, it was the worst flight I've ever been on, I'd say. <laughs> and then. I had no sleep on that flight, so then I had to then wake up the next morning at 7am, so I had like 5 hours sleep because I got in at 12am, uh, and then fly straight to Italy, uh, Milan, to play Italian League on the Saturday, and I was absolutely cooked, like travelling that much and then having to play, I had to play Yusuf Solomon on the morning, we both travelled to be fair on that same day. And then I had to play another match an hour later after Solomon's. I was absolutely toasted. And that is why I couldn't do what you do. Because yeah. uh, it's it's brutal. But but I think what it's a symptom of is the lack of money in squash, right? Yeah. The, the players, like what a lot of people don't realise is the players are forced to travel a lot because they're having to play league matches all over the, you know Europe, yeah. all over the world, um, to just get a bit of extra money to be able to live. Uh, while playing on yeah. the tour uh, and this is obviously a problem like you know a lot of other sports aren't like that if you're top 50 in the world in tennis you're not going to be doing all these extra little things no. to try and force an income no 
the, there's a positive and downside to it. Like the positive is that you have these great weekends and these great t- times yeah. away and see these extra cool places and try different food and everything. But it does come with a cost to it. There, you actually you're extra fatigued. In this instance, I chose to play Italian league just because I knew I'd have some good matches. Mm. I didn't realize how tired I would be. But obviously, the pay is quite good. But it was also the last little push of this, mm. the end of the year. So yeah. like for me, that was just like the last push. And then I've got four or five weeks off and then I start again mm. in January. Yeah. But also, it, it, like by being forced to do these extra things, it, it doesn't increase injury risk too, right? Because you're you're pushing your body more. I mean, I know you told me how tired you were after um, after Hong Kong. Yeah. Having to play again against Yusuf Solomon. Yeah, like top 11 player in the world. Like, right? you know, that... That's horrible. Like yeah. it's ridiculous. Yeah, we almost played an hour, and then I had to. I had like an hour off, and I had to yeah. play again straight off. Yeah, and then like on top of that, you're playing Surrey League, Hampshire League, yeah. Sussex League. Yeah. Um. You know, some people are playing Yorkshire League. Some, yeah. you know, some are playing Berkshire League. Whatever. Um. There, there are so many leagues going on at the same time. Uh. And it's just like an overwhelming amount of squash that these players have to play to, to be able to make a living, even if they're really good. Yeah. Uh, so it's definitely, uh, there, there's a lot of work to be done, uh, hopefully with the Olympic um, inclusion, inclusion um, in 2028 at Los Angeles. Hopefully that will bring more eyes to squash, get better TV deals or whatever. And who knows, but that that's down to the management of, of yeah. you know, PSA, World Squash Federation, all that sort of thing. And the, um, and the national federations. Like, I yeah. know for England squash, the funding system will change, so I think the players in time will, will get better benefits yes. from being funded by UK Sport rather than Sport England. So yeah. I think it's going to make a difference in the next couple of years. Yeah, I mean, we'll, we'll see what the changes will be. Uh, but I think it's going to be. A, I think it's going to be a real big positive for the sport. Yeah, and obviously we want it to go down to grassroots level as well. Yeah. We want to get more club players getting involved yeah. and, and more interest in the professional game because um, the the obviously you want the overall quality of squash around the world to be higher. Yeah, uh, that's a good thing. Um, and watching professional squash automatically gives you a better understanding of what you should be doing. Yeah. You know, like even even things like oh hit less cross courts like it's, it's simple things like that well they might not understand quite why like for a beginner yeah. if they're watching professionals play and saying oh they're not hitting short every shot they're trying to hit long first they're trying to build, they're they're trying to build a rally and, and they might not know the details but just by watching a, a constructed rally from a professional player it gives them an idea of what they should be trying to look for in a rally yeah. and what they should be doing on court and I think that that's what you want to see more of you, yeah. want, you want to be able to go down to leisure centres and see the people playing and them not just like facing the front wall patting yeah. the ball up against the yeah, front yeah, wall the, the wall watchers yeah the wall watchers uh you want them to to be turning their shoulders you want them to be trying to hit to the back of the court it doesn't matter if they don't have great high and coordination yeah. that comes with time but just trying to do the right things and i think that's kind of what you need for increase the increase the general level of squashing within yeah. club space yeah and yeah. i think by being squash being in the olympics that will automatically happen because all the beginning squash players who Start. play with their mate yeah. they'll be oh it's on it's on the tv on the olympic in the olympics uh, i'm going to watch a bit of this and they might have never seen it before even if they've played for yeah. a couple of years but they haven't been too interested in it, in it other than that yeah. Yeah. and that th- just by watching they'll actually improve their game mm-hmm. um which is, i mean obviously i mean i've got a lot of thoughts about the broadcast itself that i'll make a video on at some point um but the, the better the broadcast is as a whole and the commentators and, and analysts and all that sort of thing uh the more that will bring that that side of the game on as well um but yeah that, that's a separate video that uh, i'm quite passionate about uh, yeah um so moving on yeah um who at like today, out of all the players, is there anyone that you have looked up to, who you kind of aspire to uh, be like, and has that changed from who you when you who you're looking at when you were younger? When I was yeah, so when I was younger, I would say I was I was always looking up to people like Jonathan Jonathan Power and the way he played, hmm. maybe not the way he acted, but the way he played. Way he played. <laughs> uh, like how I love his brand of squash and the deception and like. Uh, the the holds and things like that and that's that's something I really like Mm -hmm. and then when I was a little bit older like 12, 13, 14 like I really looked up to Nick Matthew and James Wilstrop Mm. I just had a lot of a lot of respect for how good they were Uh, and competing right at the top of the game multiple world championship Mm -hmm. championships world number ones etc and I said one second when you watch James and Nick play each other 
Did you want one of them to win in particular? Yeah. Who did you want to win? Nick. You wanted Nick to win. That's interesting. Yeah. There you go. That's a quick question. Uh, uh, yeah, Nick. And then now, I wouldn't say there's like one guy I want to like imitate because like, I guess I'm not really a kid anymore and like you can't just pick one player to copy everything off. So like there's a few guys at the top of the game like Farag, Shabaggy and even someone like Cole now like I want to take bits of their game and implement it into mine and make it a well-rounded game. Mm-hmm. I don't think picking just one player is just no. is necessary. Really, you can't mould yourself into a complete one person. No, you've got to pick little bits and try your best to do what they do well. Yeah, uh, and obviously some players have passed as well. Like that's that's how I'm kind of thinking about it at the moment. Mm. Yeah. No, I, I think. By trying to combine the best attributes from from all the players, that that's kind of the way I used to look at it when I was yeah. younger. Uh, the problem is, uh, you're always inclined to look at your favourite players like the most exciting to watch. Yeah. Like, like you, you watch Rami play and Shabana play, and, and uh, you want to start doing what they do. But yeah, it's it's, it's, it's a bit more complex. Than it's that. so complex what they're trying to do to understand it. Like, it's not about just copying them because they're doing things for a reason. Yeah. And if you don't know the reason, then you're doing it wrong. Yeah. Right. Because you're not doing it at the right times. Mm-hmm. Like to understand and break down how Rami plays squash, like that could that will take decades, really. Uh, like, <laughs> and does he even really know? Like, does, oh, I'm pretty sure that's a good idea. Yeah, yeah, but like, he's very. You can tell he's very clever with the way he yeah. approaches it to the game. But would he be able to coach it? I think I think he could. Do you think? I mean, I would. Oh, I'd love to see. I, I, I mean, apparently, he coached himself a lot of his career. I would so love. He figured out a lot of things for himself, and I think he has a lot to. A lot of knowledge to pass on. Yeah, I, I would love to have a week of training or, or a week of uh, um, coaching from Rami or Shabana. That'd be interesting. Like, can you imagine how how many stories you'd have to tell from that? Like, yeah. they're just such iconic players. I mean, obviously, you've got someone like Jonathan Powers done a lot of um, coaching videos and yeah. stuff now on, on, on squash, different, skills, on squash yeah. skills and, and stuff like that he's very well involved in the game still like, yes. he just moved to Qatar whereas I, I mean Shabana's doing some coaching right no is he not no he's tried it for a year didn't like oh, it oh he tried it okay fair enough but yeah you don't see much from Shabana or Rami well Rami's got his own squash academy in Egypt I know that yes okay he's got his own like club or something yeah I'm not sure how much coaching he's actually doing yeah exactly I, I don't know because I know he's obviously doing a lot of singing and stuff yeah. like that yeah, um, <laughs> I have always a bit of song and dance. A bit of song and dance. He's a very so uh, is Josh. <laughs> <laughs> we'll try and get him on the podcast and a bit of song and dance. He enjoys that. What song would you get me to sing? A bit of Mariah Carey, all up for Christmas is you. <laughs> That's a good little Christmas special, isn't it? Christmas special comes out every year. Yeah. No, it doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> what? what about you? What would you, what would be your uh, go to karaoke song? I'm very good at karaoke, so it's a hard one to pick. Yeah. Probably like. Uh, Hall of Fame by the script. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I remember there was a, a Jonathan Power um, song. Yeah, it was. It, there was like a, an the old tune. old video of, on YouTube of like Jonathan Power highlights, and it had that song on, on it? backing. It, it's like really back. grainy footage. All oh, right, yeah. Of him, you know, like of him like pretending it got shot by a, a BB gun in the back of the leg or something like that. You yeah. know, when he got cramped uh, against Peter Nickel. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> uh, that's what I remember of that song. But yeah, yeah. Um, well, maybe we'll, we'll get an exclusive on 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 Instagram or or YouTube of, of Curtis singing that song. Yeah, very good. So yeah, I'll, we'll see. if he's as good at singing of that as he is at squash, then well, maybe he's got another career. Um, well, some say I'm actually better at singing, but I chose the squash path. Well, I mean, why though? Yeah, it's a very painful path. Let's, to let's move on. We'll, we'll <laughs> <laughs> okay, so now looking forwards, mm-hmm. yeah. What are your goals as a player? Where What are your aspirations? Where do you want to get ranked? I don't like to put particular numbers on it, really. Like, I think if you're if you're a pro training full-time and you're well-established in, say, the top 100, top 50, whatever, mm-hmm. and you're relatively, not, relatively young, mm-hmm. I don't see why you should be training and not aiming to be the best in the world. So for me, I, I want to be the best in the world. That's a that's a clear goal. Mm-hmm. But I know there's a lot of steps before that to take to get there. Yeah. 
So I've broken in top 50 now, I'm on 45, so the next target is top 30, then it's top 20, and then the top 10. You've got, you've got to break it down like that. If you try and go too big too soon, then you're just a bit disheartened every time you lose a match. Yeah. So f- for me, like, I'm not thinking too long term, I'm thinking more short term, like, mm. how am I going to approach this next block of training so that I'm in the best possible shape for the next tournament? Yeah. What do I need to be working on? in this part of my session so I can yeah. so that I'm ready for the next session to to get those things right for when I'm competing my next team game or something. Like mm-hmm. I, I use team matches as a way to improve. Like yeah. if if you don't use that every chance you've got on court to improve then to me it's a waste of time. Yeah. And like even just like keeping myself injury free, that's like a little goal I have is to keep injury free. Because I look at it in the sense that if you're injured, you can't train. If you can't train you can't improve. Yeah. And for me, that's that's the biggest thing. I've had enough years of when I was younger, of periods of time out of the game where I've missed a lot of time. So mm. now I'm trying to maximise on what I've got. I'm healthy and fit. And, uh, touch wood, I don't get injured mm. again. And just trying to keep pushing on and see where I can get into the rankings. Yeah. And, and just touching on using your team matches to improve. Now, this is something I always struggled with. Yeah. Just because I always felt like team matches... Unless you're already established as a player, mm-hmm. I feel like I always tried to use them to try and prove myself, and that made me play worse. Yeah. Like I mentioned earlier, like I, I put too much pressure on myself as people are looking at these results, and if you have a bad result, then um, people are going to think, "Oh, he's not that good," yeah. and then that's you're more likely to have a bad result, which is what happened yeah. a lot of the time. So. Whereas for you, because people already know you're good, you don't have to worry about that. It's yeah. just I can, it, you know, no one cares about my league match result. They care about my tournament result. Well, I used to think I used to care a lot about my league match results. I, I still do. Yeah. But I, I care if internally. I don't care what other people think about yeah. the results. Yes. Because to me, I use them as another way to. There's that's like the middle ground between the PSA and practice match. That's yeah. In between yeah, yeah. because a practice match, you're really going to practice on the thing. You don't mind if you make a few errors. Whereas yeah. a team match or a league game or it's whatever European league you're playing. Yeah. You're treating it very seriously like a PSA game, but you're trying to do things that you, you're trying to transition from your training matches or training sessions into those games. Yeah. So you just got to be prepared to not worry about what other people think and just really go out there and do the things you need to be doing to improve yeah. and get to the next level. Now, I think it's a good way of looking at it. Like the league match is the middle ground. Yeah. Right for for a professional at least. Obviously, if you're a club player, the team match is the match. That's yeah, that's that's the main that's thing. the main thing. Um, but if you're a professional, that that team match is that middle transitional phase from getting the things you're learning in practice into tournament play. Yeah, and it's that bridging the gap. Do it in practice, then be able to do it in a team match, then be able to do it in a tournament. Yeah. And if you look at it like that, then it's easier to get all the things you're working on into the tournament play, which yeah. is what you want. You want it to become natural under pressure yeah. in the biggest on the biggest stage. Yeah. Um, now, just going back to like the future and recent times, mm-hmm. um, to that we'll wrap it up soon. But um, just I like what you did there. Wrap it up. You wrap it at Christmas. Yeah, I did that on purpose. Right. Sorry, carry on. Yeah, on purpose. Uh, <laughs> um, now, I know you went to Hong Kong recently, as we talked about earlier. Now, I lived in Hong Kong for two years when I was young, yeah. um, from 2012 to 2014, so I'd have been 13 to 15 years old. Now, uh, you actually went to my club out there, Hong Kong Football Club. Um, now, uh, do you want to sum up what it's like there? Because I've always tried to explain yeah. um, to Curtis, before he's ever been there, what it's actually like at Hong Kong Football Club. And if, if anyone's been there or is from there... Um, you'll know <laughs> why I, I talk about it in, in, in you know with such high yeah. regard. So I went there, obviously for the Hong Kong Platinum. It was at uh, the Hong Kong National Centre, so it was a different club. But the week before, there was a bronze event at the Hong Kong Football Club, and it's a very very well attended event, very popular. There's pack crowds every day. Members love it. I remember I, I swept really swap the courts it. when it was. It used to be a twenty five k when I was there. Yeah, uh, I, I did the court sweeping there. <laughs> I, I heard so, someone talking about that when I, they were there. <laughs> <laughs> was it Gowan? No, <laughs> no, he wasn't there, was he? Twenty five k. I did. Uh, no, I did sweep for Gowad and Abulgar. He did tell me about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if you watch, like, like, that's the best court set I've ever had. Yeah, well, I I was just shocked at the accuracy of their short game. Yeah. But anyway, keep anyway, going. so the club, 
Uh, yeah, super nice club. It's a private club, I believe. Uh, yes. Yeah, you have to like, pay a certain fee to be a member of the club. And you can see why. What I like about it is they really care about all the sports there. And the squash as you walk in the alleyway, they've got T-shirts signed of all the pros who have won that previous edition of the tournament, which is really mm-hmm. nice. It's a nice little touch. And then you walk in into the courts. So they've got these two glass backs kind of backing onto each other. A uh, glass course, that's what I say. And then mm-hmm. they've got, I think, three or four others around the side. Yeah, I think they've got seven courts overall. And when I was there on three of the courts, they put in glass walls. So so they're, they're still white, yeah. but they put glass layers on them. So they behave like a glass court. Yeah. You use a black wall on them still, yeah. uh, but they behave like a glass court. So they, they feel, well, they're unforgiving, but yeah. very rewarding courts to play on. yeah. And then everything else about the club was lovely. Like the players were, were able, the players in the platinum event were able to go and use the the restaurant area, like the upstairs area, like the spa area with the sauna, steam room. There's like an outdoor pool which overlooks a lot of the surroundings, which is really nice. It's quite high up, and mm, the, just nice. the quality of the the facilities there was very high. It was very nice yeah. to be there. And, and it, so essentially it's it's on what's called the Happy Valley Race Course. So it's a horse racing track. Yeah. And you've got the squash club. Um, so you go in. It's on the outside of this horse racing track. And then there's a tunnel that goes underneath the horse racing track and then comes up to the middle, in the middle of the track. And that has all their sports pitches, football, rugby, whatever. Yeah. Uh, and that's all in the middle with some restaurants. They've got a load of restaurants everywhere. Um, bars and all that. They've got a bowling alley. Yeah, they've uh, got a bowling alley. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they've got a bowling alley and there's squash courts. They've got a bowling green, a massive one. Oh, it's blue actually, isn't it? Yeah. Bowling blue. blue. Yeah. A, a bowling blue. <laughs> it's huge. There was loads of, there was actually like international, Lawn bowls. international like veterans tournament going on. Yeah. It's quite impressive. Yeah, and then, and then the, in one of the bars, the, the window looks out to the race course. So on a Friday or Saturday evening, you can watch the horse racing and all that. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I used to spend all day down there just because it was such a nice place. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, we're talking like marble columns and like yeah. when you walk in, it, yeah, it's yeah, it's state, state of the art, really. It's fantastic. You're not, not going to get many nicer clubs than that. No. Let alone in Hong Kong, but around the world as well. This yeah. It's a very nice club. Oh, it's fantastic. But um, I definitely miss it there. I'd love to go back, but haven't been since I left. Yeah. 11, wait, how many years ago? No, it would have been nine years ago yeah. or so, yeah. roughly. Um, but yeah, and just like you mentioned having having food when you were uh, there, like when you go away, how do you make sure that your diet is um, similar enough to when you're training at home to make it so that that's, you're comfortable? That's a good question. It's actually quite tough to make it similar to what you'd have at home. Uh, I actually quite, I'm predominantly plant-based, plant-based predominantly. So like 90% of my diet will be, will be plant-based, vegan. Uh, but I'll I'll have some fish here and there, and then I'll also have a little bit of like eggs or whatever. Mm-hmm. But then when I'm like traveling and stuff, I'm a little bit more relaxed because I know that I can't always eat the foods I would eat at home. So I have to be, and I would I also like to immerse myself in the cultures there and try a lot of different lots of different foods. I'm a real food fanatic. I'm probably got a bit of an addiction to food. <laughs> you don't uh, look like you do. <laughs> I have I the addiction like to do, food. But in my head, I do. <laughs> uh, so when I go to like Singapore, Hong Kong, India, Pakistan, whatever, I love trying all these different foods. Yeah. So, but then you've got to rein it in a little bit because if you go too far off what you normally eat, you might upset your stomach or something before yeah. your matches and stuff. Mm-hmm. So, I like to try different foods, but I also like to stick to what I know on game days, especially yeah. like morning. I always have the same breakfast, mm-hmm. lunch is normally the same thing, and then after the match, I might try something else. So you wouldn't go to the Paradise Balti House on on a game day then. No, <laughs> that's no. that's uh, my local curry house uh, that Curtis very much enjoys going to yeah. when he comes round. <laughs> do very much enjoy that one. They do a good uh, masala sauce, chicken so, tikka yeah. masala. Mm. Should be good. Well, yeah. Well, in uh, fact, we'll, we'll leave that. Yeah. Well, we'll leave that. We don't want to make the viewers hungry. So. Well, no. I mean, I think it wraps it up fairly nicely because um, I'm getting getting relatively hungry. Yeah. So, <laughs> so it's probably time to actually. Uh, soon to, to, to go off to the Paradise Balti House yeah. in fact well, it's been a good episode thanks for having me on the uh, on yeah the, I mean on I, the show I, I, well yeah I, I'm very glad that you could make it on uh, and hopefully the viewers uh, and listeners 
uh, enjoyed um, hearing your words about your career so far yeah. and what you're looking forward to in the future. Relatively short career so far. So well, yeah, I mean, more to come, like. well, exactly. I think that we, we there's definitely more to talk about for a part two, I, I yeah. reckon. Um, get a part two out. Get a part two. Or, I mean, if you want to see a part two, please leave a like and subscribe to the channel below. Um, and you know, put a comment in there to say your thoughts on it. Any questions as well for next? Any one? questions, uh, you know, for Curtis, for me, um, I'll, you're probably more likely to want to ask Curtis. <laughs> but if you've got anything for me, I'll, I'll try and answer. Um, and do you have anything to say to uh, the listeners or your fans? Uh, yeah, just thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. Hope you enjoyed it. Uh, obviously, we have our me and my siblings have our own team manager channel. So if mm. you want to find any of our content we do vlogs where we travel around the world and show what it's like to be on the tour so our, I'm sure Josh will put the handle in the description so it's Team Malik yeah. uh, you can find more content and information about us on there and we have our own website so just stay tuned on some more more stuff to come yeah no definitely uh, definitely check out that channel it's got loads of great content on and thanks for watching guys see you next time <laughs>